from Mark Pike, who's talking about vertical prehistory, a brick-based methodology. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to bore some people in this room because this is something I talk about all the time and you've heard me go on about it. And so we've very familiar slides and things. Um, I'm going to also start pretty much where Mark finished. I'm going to start with a landscape. Um, and I am going to try and present an archaeology uh, that expresses or came out of my frustration of dots or maps or of typologies or distributions and things and wanting to get out context. And as an archaeologist, having a sort of sense of confidence in the context that I excavated and feeling that it, the actual story might be within the landscape I was excavating rather than somewhere else sort of thing. So that sort of sense of trying to articulate um, the sites that I excavated and, and, and pretty much do it from what was in front of me rather than perhaps something that was at the HER or, or somewhere else. Sort of thing. So, and it also comes out of a frustration, I think, of, of digging sort of flat landscapes, the sort of gravel terraces and things, where in terms of prehistoric landscapes, the, the palimpsest being a particularly flat palimpsest, this idea that we'd get features that would very rarely um, intersect or superimpose, in this sort of sense that we'd get this sort of pattern of field systems and monuments and pits and things, with very little overlap. So we'd have a sort of an awareness of its sort of spatial distribution, but our temporal resolution was always very crude or very coarse, and often was dependent on there being a piece of collador and or there being a radio carbon date from this they just things. But I felt like our, our spatial resolution was was getting very good, but our temporal resolution was often either expensive or 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 just 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 a bit ambiguous and a bit fluffy and things. And we ended up getting very sort of conflated landscapes. And this idea that, although we might be talking about 3,000 years of the landscape being used, we might only produce sort of two plans of that sort of thing. And there's a sense that everything was sort of conflated into the same space. So I, in, in that frustration, I was thinking about what, what might be in the, in the archaeology that I was excavating that would help articulate both time and space at the same time. And I was very fortunate to end up in a brick pit. And I was very fortunate to end up in the, the biggest hole in Fenland. And in a way, if, if this talks about anything, it's about expressing why I want to stay in Finland and why I want to keep going down the contour and excavating in that context. And I, to me, in a way, I feel like it's the place to, to research British prehistory. And the thing I think I'm, I'm working on, the, the thing that I'm investigating is effectively is, a, is an incline, is a, is a ramp, is a, a gradient that I'm following from Peterborough to Doggerland, effectively. And it's that gradient that I try and situate my archaeology. And it's, and it's based around that relationship between age and altitude, the, the bottom of the North Sea and the Holocene period from 10,000 BP to present. And that sense that the North Sea was once dry land and the rising sea level, and that sense of, of movement up that gradient and how time and space or past people's movements and activities occur along that line and how it gives you that sense of being able to be able to articulate the landscapes that we investigate. So to put Fenland into that context, for me it's it's important in the sense that the the dynamic of the North Sea is also the dynamic of the Fenland Basin. Um, and it's it's that that sense that we could have once walked from Peterborough to Amsterdam and now we're, we're sat in Peterborough on the edge of Fenland. And it's that, that idea that a landscape can be terrestrial and then it can be underwater. And that idea that the, and the landscape itself is, is fluid and, and mobile and ever-changing and, and the things that are going on within that space. And that sort of drama of, of the way that time plays out within the spaces that we excavate. It's Graham Clark, and it's, it's his relationship to the Mesolithic, and this, this idea that he's realising that the Mesolithic's at the bottom of the North Sea, <coughs> he's desperate to get out of it, and he's told by people like Harry Godwin, well, if you want to get to the bottom of the North Sea, you can get there by proxy by going to the bottom of Fenland. And essentially, the Fenland sequence is, is commensurate with the North Sea forming, and that the base, basin of the Fenland Basin is, is basically the bottom of the Fenland Basin is the equivalent to the southern plains of the Great North Sea Plain. 
and it's that sense of sediment and a sense of geological superposition. The idea that we're not seeing palimpsest, we're seeing the build-up of deposits and the separation of time, and the idea of things being basically um, kept apart or kept intact, and that kind of preservation. So Clark goes to Shipley Hill and he digs his trench and he finds the Mesolithic, the Neolithic, and the early Bronze Age in articulation within the settlement of Fenland. And for the first time in British prehistory, we get the sense that we're no longer dealing with typology, but we're actually dealing with context. But more importantly for me is that he also recognises the gradient of Fenland itself, this diagonal line, and how it's commensurate with prehistory, and how as prehistory is being played out, it's being played out along that, that incline, along that ramp. Um, and he recognises that that ramp also has a significance for our story in the sense of what he calls his surface available for settlement. So in the Mesolithic, there's plenty of surface. And by the early Bronze Age, there's little surface left. And that idea of space and time being basically being played out together in, in sort of coordination. And so we can end up with maps like Fraser Sturts and Fenland, where we have lots of land, and then we have lots of water, or lots of waterborne deposits and things and that sense of that, that dynamic with our map. But I suppose my title of vertical prehistory is, is the sense that what I like is that the Fenner Basin is effectively a concave landscape and it's got these sediments falling over time and the sense that these sediments are they're not erosive, they're, they're soft, they, they, they sort of protect them. So as well as being wet in the sense that they get would get waterlogged preservation, we also get the preservation of the earthworks, we also get preservation of relationships, we also get the preservation of the environment. There's a, a relationship here between geology and environment and context, and this sense of that texture being all interconnected creates a kind of archaeology that I feel in a way that is we miss when we're, we're up at the top on these horizontal landscapes where everything's conflated and everything's mixed up. And I feel like this sort of sense of, of intact landscapes, I suppose, and the sort of things that perhaps we, we sort of imagine that being happening on the sort of Swiss lake villages and things like that, or maybe Glastonbury and things, happening within the federal context. But obviously the paradox there is that they're so deeply buried that we can't use our sort of more normative sort of um, prospect prospection techniques and things, so aerial photography and field walking and geophysical survey all fail in the <coughs> sediments and things. We have to find a way of getting into that into that ground. So to use Crane Begg's map again, um, and to give a context for for Must Farm and for Bradley Fan and the landscapes that I work in with and the Wooksy Brick Pits, they, they show very clearly on this map because they have the deepest holes, they have the deepest contour, they sit on the edge of Wooksy Island. So this map basically is a colour ramp, it shows contour through colour. So the North Sea is the same colour as the Cambridgeshire Banks, so that sense of how low we are, but also this sense of a landscape that's sort of convex and a landscape that's concave, and that sense of the relationship between the archaeology on this side of that, that boundary and the archaeology on this side of that boundary. So for example, if we, if we look for archaeology in the Neen in Northamptonshire coming up to Peterborough, and then we look at the archaeology that exists within the Fenland Basin, or in particular within the Flagman Basin, they, they appear in very different ways. So this is on the North Lanternshire side of Peterborough, and we get ring ditches. It's all, it's all plowed down, it's all denuded, the earthworks, the superstructure is gone, we're ending up with these sort of negative features of these palimpsest landscapes. Meantime, within the Flagman Basin, the same monuments are just starting to pierce through the peat and show their heads and things as, as earthworks. So we're getting a sort of a sense here of preservation and also articulation of, of those features. So here's the context of, of my talk and, and of my work, I suppose, which is the, the Wittlesey Group. It's the, the biggest hole in Fenland. And as you can see, we have no problem with depth. It's a sense of, of the sediment and that sense of that relationship. So we, essentially, we've got um, Mesolithic deposits down here, and we've got Sort of middle Bronze Age, late Bronze Age deposits up here, and Iron Age in the top of this, this river channel and things. So the sense of our, our sediment sequence being commensurate with prehistory, and that sense that we're able, 
within the context of the brickworks to articulate those, those settlements and articulate the features that exist within them. So we're doing essentially a strip map and record archaeology, but on a, on a depth of what Clark was doing in the 1930s at Chippy Hill. So we sort of brought the two things together as a, as a sort of combination. What I like about this image more than anything else is the, the sense that two people at the bottom here, one is a geologist and one is an archaeologist, and they stand side by side and they're, they're sort of at the intersection of the deposits and things. And I feel in a way that that's what we're starting to do with our archaeology within Must Farm. We're doing a sort of, I don't know if it's the right sense of the word geoarchaeology or archaeogeology, whatever sort of thing, but it's that since we're, we're meeting the, the two disciplines together in that sense of uh, the depths that we reach, we're starting to use techniques perhaps from, from that world and thinking about the sort of texture as well as the content. And just like my earlier gradient, we can put our radio carbon dates together with our contours and things and end up with that same gradient occurring. So you can see how that, that sort of fits in with the, the North Sea. So our landscape is where to reconstruct it, we can, we can show Fengate and Musk Farm and Bradley Fen and Briggs Farm and I and Holdhog Farm and things. And you can see that Peterborough and Stanford and Woodsy Island. We're able to get to the bottom of that, that peat and fen clay sequence and start seeing terrestrial landscapes represented by buried soils, by monuments, with upstanding earthworks, monuments that were built pre-fen, that are dried out pre-fen, that have no water or preservation. And then when the landscape does start getting saturated, we start seeing the water log elements, we start seeing the articulation of fence lines and, and hoof prints and when the peat starts to form within that space, it starts to get between the archaeology and into sea, and it starts to allow us to see the sort of response to that, that saturation of things that forms in these banks and ditches start to run along the contour of things. So in the context of the Flagfen Basin or the Fenland Basin in relationship to the same dynamic as the North Sea, I suppose, that sense of the gradient allows us to start pulling our palaces apart without thinking about individual dates, but actually start thinking about the time of things themselves and their duration and their extent and the idea of movement and mobility. And I like this idea that our landscape itself starts to become articulated. And we start to sort of move between the features as well, sort of thing. There's a sense of connectedness here. Um, and we can see what happens when the peak comes in and how these same spaces start to transform. And we're able to reconstruct the Flagfen Basin in, in many forms and start showing it as a very fluid landscape. And in, in many ways, start showing that the Flagfen Basin itself is quite late in that story. So we end up with a river valley, um, and then we, end, we finish with our sequence with the basin itself. So that sort of mutability, I suppose, of the context of our sites. Um, and, I, and I suppose, really, in my, in my pursuit of, of the sort of time and space within these landscapes, I'm really interested in that sense of, of movement and that sense of, of the, the, the sort of, I keep using the sort of photographic sort of metaphor of my archaeology, which is this sense that I feel in a way that we're taking long exposures of the landscapes that we excavate. And then our exposures are, are so long that people don't live long enough to, to sort of frequent them. But we know that they're present because we find the, the very features that they construct with things. And I feel in a way that within the landscape of the, the Wurtsey Brick Pits and things, that we're starting to get our exposure times down. And I feel in a way that we're, we're not quite seeing the people, obviously, but the sense is that we're starting to see some sense of, of the very movement between the features that we excavate and things. And it's getting to that point where it's, it just feels like we're creating a sort of new language for the archaeology because it, it's so intact and it's so so immediate in its, in its, sort of, in its preservation. So I'll just finish off quickly, and in a way, it's, a, it's an invite to the group, I suppose, to come and see us out at Musfarm. We're about to, we're in the process now of starting the Musfarm platform excavation. Um, the excavation of a paleo charm up the top of our sequence. Um, the late course of a sort of distributive of the River Neen, um, the causeway, um, the freshwater channel that sits within the sequence of those deeper sediments of the Black Pen Basin. And I don't, I don't want to talk about all the fines that we've been getting from the river and things and that, and I think that's an opportunity for someone else involved in the project we're later in one of the group meetings to talk about it. And the sense of the scale of the work and the, the sense that the river's all there hasn't been 
taken away by later chance and benefits. You can walk along into a bank and you can see its history being played out. And you can also interconnect that within the flag fed basin in terms of what's happening with the rest of the landscape. And it allows us to think about the platform in that story and its articulation and its preservation, be it through waterlogging or through the very fact that the sediments themselves are still there and, and have that sense of the depth again. And just the quality of the evidence within that sort of nested story, I suppose, that I've presented today between the North Sea and the, the Muscogon Channel. Um, I'll finish that. Thank you.